In the 1930s, a peculiar story began filtering out from the towns and villages surrounding a small farm on the western coast of the Isle of Man. Reports of a talking animal, a local spook that could sing the Manx national anthem, engross itself in the local gossip and hunt rabbits better than any of the local poachers, had made their rounds locally and shot out into the wider world, confounding anyone who gave the story the time of day. If only those interested in the affair had been as smart as the spook itself who had cheerfully told the owner of the farm one evening, if you knew what I know, you'd know a hell of a lot. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark Histories, Season 7, Episode 23. And today, well, this has been a long time coming for this episode. Uh, We're going to be talking about Jeff, the talking mongoose. It's going to be a two-part episode because there is just so much of Jeff. Uh, you might have noticed already this episode is coming out a week later than it normally would have. It was it was due out last week. But it proved to be a little bit challenging tracking down a few sources. But as I was writing it, it kind of worked out because I, I realised actually this is going to be a, a two-part episode. But it gave me a little bit of time to allow for the, the slack postage on a couple of the sources that I, that I bought. So, um, yeah, uh, it, it kind of all worked out. The good news also is, although it's a two-part episode, it's not going to be another two weeks for part two. I'm going to still release that uh, like as scheduled next Sunday because basically as I was waiting for some sources to arrive, um, I just um, carried on writing on, on, on what I could. So, yeah, I've, I've basically uh, made a two-part episode in three weeks, which is great. So, yeah, with, with all that said, well, let's get into uh, the Dolby Spook. Jeff the Talking Mongoose. Situated in the Irish Sea, practically equidistant from the northeast coast of England, Scotland and Ireland, the Isle of Man is a relatively small island, 33 miles long and 13 miles wide, housing a population of around 80,000 people. Ancient settlers made their homes on the island during the Mesolithic Age, whilst modern settlers, who would go on to develop the Manx language, made their way to the Isle in the form of Irish missionaries during the middle of the 5th century. Since then, the island has seen a history of invasion and occupation by forces from across the British Isles and further afield, including the Anglo-Saxons, the Scottish, the Vikings and the English, which all led to a diverse local culture, heavily influenced by its Celtic and Norse beginnings, though it's been heavily anglicised since the boom of the tourist industry in the 19th century. Dotted throughout with historical sites, Manx folklore runs rich through the country, with myths and legends of fairies, black dogs, giants, goblins and ghosts. The isle itself is said to be the throne of the king of the other world, the god of the dead and of the first ancestors of the human race, Mananam MacLear, whose horse carries the dead across the sea to the other side. The first ruler of the isle it is Mananam MacLear, from whom the isle takes its name. As king, one story tells of a time he turned away an impending Viking invasion by creating a magic illusion that multiplied a single soldier to appear as a thousand, lining the battlements of their stone fort. In the 1930s, the Isle of Man was a popular holiday destination throughout the United Kingdom, with many of its large Victorian houses having been converted into hotels in the early 1900s, especially in Ramsey on the northeast coast, which had access to promenades and quiet, secluded beaches offering a more relaxed holiday than other popular British seaside destinations like Brighton and Blackpool. Outside of Ramsey, Douglas and Peel on the east and west coasts housed the majority of the Isle's population, with the interior consisting of mostly rural farmland, with farmhouses dotted sporadically throughout, sometimes many miles from their nearest neighbours. One such farm was Dawlish Cashin, a small livestock holding owned by the Irving family who had moved to the Isle of Man looking to take advantage of its peaceful surroundings and cheap land during the rocky economical days of the First World War. Little did they know that the farm came complete with a resident that would go on to become one of the Isle's most bizarre residents of all time. James Irving was born in a suburb of Liverpool in January 1873. His father was a train driver which afforded him a relatively comfortable upbringing in the thriving northern city. His wife, Margaret, also had a train driver for her father and had also grown up in Liverpool. However, as one of ten children, Margaret's home life was somewhat more cramped. The pair married in 1897 and four months later gave birth to their first child, 
a daughter which they named Elsie, followed by a son three years later named Gilbert Ramsay. Margaret worked in Liverpool as a dressmaker, whilst James ran a successful piano dealership, importing instruments from the Dominion Piano and Organ Company of Canada and acting as the principal agent for the business throughout Europe. It was an interesting enough position for James, who enjoyed the travel that the job offered and gave him a chance to indulge in his interest in languages, whilst also supplying the Irving family with a very comfortable income. And before long, the small family, along with their servant, were settling down into their suburban terraced Liverpool home in the respectable neighbourhood of Wavertree, a leafy retreat for wealthy Liverpudlians since the Victorian period, complete with botanic gardens. Unfortunately, the First World War put paid to James's good position when the British government imposed a 33% luxury goods import tax in order to help free up shipping space for materials intended for the war effort. Since musical instruments fell under the banner of luxury goods, his dealership sank more or less overnight, leaving the Irvings somewhat stranded. James tried his hand starting an engineering company and he dabbled in the housing market for a while, but eventually conceded that he needed to find something new. With Margaret's parents living on the Isle of Man, the family floated the idea of upping sticks and starting a new chapter as farmers, and when the sale of a farm known as Dawlish Cashin showed up on the market, they made the big move, purchasing the farmhouse and around 70 acres of land for £310. Dawlish Cashin had had an interesting past. Situated halfway up a steep mount, 30 minutes from its nearest neighbours on the outskirts of the villages of Dalby and Glen May, four miles south of the town of Peel, on the west coast of the Isle, it had been part of an estate belonging to a French landowner named Pierre-Henri Joseph Bourmet, who had once held a position in the French royal court, where he fostered a career in intelligence that he would go on to capitalise on throughout his life. Eventually, moving to London, he acted in an informal clandestine role for both the French and British governments, whilst also operating with radical socialist political groups on both sides of the channel. Carry out an incestuous relationship with his sister, with whom he had two children, he was briefly embroiled in a fairly serious scandal after he sold both his sister and his daughter's bodies to a university after his sister had died during childbirth, causing several accusations that he had killed both, leading to the locals branding him with the nickname of the Islington Monster. Fascinated with the Isle of Man, Pierre Henri began purchasing land in the late 1850s and moved full time to the Isle in the 1860s, where his eccentricities including the habit of only ever eating peas, which he kept in his pockets, gained him something of a reputation, and another slightly less accusing nickname of the Frenchman. When he died in 1875, much of his estate was donated to the Isle, and eventually the rest of his property was broken up and sold off, including the farm that the Irvings bought in 1916. When James, Margaret and their son Gilbert arrived at Dawlish Cashin, they found a farmhouse that was in dire need of renovation. And so, for the first few months on the Isle, the Irvings rented a nearby cottage whilst the farmhouse was brought back to a hospitable status. The farm had links back as far as the 14th century, with evidence that there had been a farm of some design or other, possibly dating back as far as the Norse occupation in the 9th century. Whilst far more modern than either of these farms, the Dawlish Cashin of 1918 consisted of a tired-looking, blocky, two-storey farmhouse with steep sloping roof built into the marshy hillside. It had an outhouse and three precarious looking outbuildings with rusted corrugated steel roofs which held all the farm equipment and livestock. Inside the farmhouse was fairly well removed from the comfortable terraced house that they had moved from in Liverpool, low ceilings in cramped rooms lit entirely with paraffin lamps. The walls were filled with dark wood panelling that James had fitted as part of the renovations and they did little to brighten up the place. Downstairs consisted of a newly built porch that the Irvings had built as part of the renovations, which led on to a sitting room, a kitchen and a pantry, with a single staircase that led to a small landing separating two bedrooms on the first floor. On cold, grey days, outside was a bleak and lonely landscape. The nearest neighbours was a prisoner of war camp that James had leased some of his farmland to in order for the prisoners to spend their days carrying out agricultural labour. But this was at least a mile away, and the only other approach to the farmhouse was a rocky, uneven pathway carved out of the side of the steeply sloped mount that the farm was built upon. The view from the farm overlooked several miles of descending marshy fields that gave way to the sea on the horizon. 
It wasn't long after their arrival that strange happenings began on the farm. Two builders that James had employed from Peel had intended to stay at the farmhouse whilst they got on building the porch and covering the exterior of the house in grey concrete in order to quite literally cover over the cracks. But the builders only managed to stay one night after one of them had woken to strange noises. The pair chose to carry out the rest of the job commuting from the nearby village after they both decided that there was something uncanny about the place. In reality, the noises were probably the wind rattling through the old place and the unease stoked by several rumours that had circulated around the farm for decades. It had been said that a pair of labourers on the farm had at one time dug up an old urn amongst some hedgerows that when they opened it, found it to contain ashes. Shocked at the find, they reburied the urn, hoping to put the whole thing behind them. But some time later, when another man was out hunting rabbits nearby the farm, he chased what he thought was a rabbit running into some hedgerows exactly where the labourers had found the urn. Instead of finding a rabbit, when he tried to get amongst the overgrowth, he found himself being pushed back by an unseen force that unsettled him so much that he ran off without looking back. Regardless of the setbacks by the two workmen on Dawlish Cashin, the work on the farmhouse was completed, and eventually the Irvings could move in, and two years later, Margaret gave birth to their third child, a daughter which they named Voiray. Voiray grew up involved in the farm life, herding sheep and taking care of the goats, duck and geese. Elsie had remained in Liverpool with her husband when the Irvings had left for the Isle, and now Gilbert was also looking to move back to England, tired of this rural farming life. Although the Irvings' farm had started off well enough, by the mid-twenties the bottom had fallen out of livestock prices, and with the arable farming practically impossible, profits had become more and more tight. So the news that Gilbert was moving away from the farm only exacerbated matters, and when he finally left in 1928, James was forced into the choice of cutting back the farming or finding the money to pay for his costly replacement using local labour instead, which was more or less an impossible proposition given that the family were living off a miserly 15 shillings a week. Several times, James and Margaret considered selling up and moving back away from the farm, but together with Boyray and their dog, the Irvings persisted, buckling down for the hard years ahead. For the most part, life was difficult, but it progressed day by day in a quiet seclusion. James, who had once been a member of various social circles on the Isle, including the Mason's Lodge in Peel, gradually retreated back to the farm, as membership fees were increasingly difficult to come by. Then, three years later, in the winter of 1931, a new arrival on the farm shone a spotlight on the struggling farmhouse that would end up writing itself into Manx history, with an infamy as strong as any other world king. It was around the middle of September in 1931 when some fairly strange rumours began making their way through the villages and towns on the west coast of the Isle of Man concerning the farm of Dawlish Cashin. James and Margaret Irving had been speaking of hearing strange sounds coming from the ceiling of their farmhouse. It all started on Sunday, September 13th when James had heard what he described as queer little tappings and knockings, which he put down to a mouse. Opening up the wooden ceiling to see in between the space between the wood and the tiles, he looked to see if he could spot signs of anything living in the small attic. Found no trace of anything alive, though he did come across a small Indian statue carved from wood that he recognised as his own, though how it had made its way into the loft, he had no idea. Several days later, with the sounds repeating night after night, things began to progress when new sounds crept their way into the growing menagerie, as cat hisses, dog barks and strange, strangled breathing noises chipped in. But it wasn't until James heard thumping sounds running back and forth throughout the house that he really started to feel any concern, especially after one particularly large thud cracked through the house, sending a watercolour scene of Istanbul hanging on the wall, swinging left and right on its nail. For a couple of weeks... James still thought the sounds must have been coming from a rat, or at least an infestation, given that the thumps. But when he started hearing what sounded like an eerie, evil cackling, he was no longer so sure. It wasn't only James that had been hearing the noises either. Voy Ray and Margaret had both been hearing the same noises. This could at least mean that James could be sure that he wasn't going mad. And if the family were hoping for things to slowly calm down, they were to be disappointed – 
as every night for the following month, things only continued to get stranger and more disturbing. James was getting on with his business in the outhouse one evening when he heard stones being thrown at the door, whilst Voire had thought that she too had had stones thrown at her whilst inside the farmhouse and was by now feeling fairly well scared of whatever it was that had been making the noises. James was sure that he had felt something spit on him one night and whatever it was, he was also fairly sure it had been peeing in the house, leaving wet patches throughout. It was when it started talking that things really took off, however. At first, the noises had been little more than the gurgling sounds of a baby learning to talk, which James described as if something saying the word Doma Doma Blum Blum Blum, which gradually formed into the sounds of various animals over the span of a few days, which James, beginning to recognise a form of some sort of intelligence, began playing with, calling out the name of an animal and having whatever it was make the sounds of the specific animal back to him. Slowly but surely, these primitive burbles turned into words, until within a fortnight, the voice had learnt to speak as well as any adult human, though its voice rang through the house in a shrill, high-pitched tone, often manically laughing, which was described by various witnesses who visited the farm around this time as sounding like the chuckling laugh of an aged person, satanic laughter, and the laughter of a maniac. If any of this wasn't disturbing enough, things were still being tossed around the house, to the point where James feared that it might start throwing knives at him. In late October, James and Voire finally caught sight of whatever it was that had been causing the disturbances. Whatever it was, it definitely seemed like some kind of smallish animal, with a small rat-like body with a long bushy tail, body and tail being of a yellowish hue, and the tail speckled with brown. Though somewhat terrifyingly, rather than having regular paws, this animal's feet seemed to resemble human hands. Apparently they were about the size of a large doll's hands. Naturally, James's first thought was to name it Jack, before turning his mind to the idea of trapping and killing the intruder in their house, first trying to hunt it with a gun, before falling back to tried and trusted rat traps that he borrowed from a neighbour. However, after these failed, he decided trying to set up a tray full of poisoned bread in the landing at the top of the stairs, nearby where he and Voire had seen him dash behind the wood panelling. That night, terrible screams ripped through the farmhouse as the animals screamed almost solidly for a full 20 minutes, which James, who had clearly become accustomed to the farm life, described as sounding like a pig when having a horseshoe nail put through the tip of its snout. Voire slipped out of bed and looked around the farmhouse for what she assumed would be a dying animal, but despite all the noise, she found nothing. Soon after, the noises continued and James realised that the poison had failed. By December, things had become unmanageable in the house, as the noises continuously kept everyone awake throughout the night, once scaring Voire by telling her, I am a ghost in the form of a weasel. I shall haunt you with weird noises and clanking chains. This frightened her to the point where she requested James and Margaret move her bed into the bedroom so that they could all sleep together. Whilst they dismantled her bed in order to move it across the hallway, Jack continues to terrify Voire by shouting, I'll follow her wherever you move her. That night, they barricaded the door with boxes, hoping to stop any intrusion and hoping that they might be able to find some peace and quiet. But instead, it seemed to simply provoke their unwanted guest as the door pushed in, bulging at the seams, as though some terrific force were thrusting against it. With the noisy, unusually talkative animal not seemingly going away any time soon, and sure by now that whatever the animal was, it was most likely trying to push them out of the farm, James decided to pursue a new tact. Instead of trying to eliminate Jack, he would instead try and make friends with him. Rather than leaving poison out, he instead started leaving small bits of untainted food in any of the nooks and crannies that he had not filled in when he had been trying to keep him out in the first place. In the mornings, the food would be gone, and he soon noted that food was going missing from the kitchen overnight too. Testing out the animal's palate, it seemed he enjoyed eating well, more or less anything that James could test him with, taking bites of chocolate, banana and bacon. The only things he seemed to turn his nose up at were bread and milk, perhaps tainted by the earlier attempts of poison. As James had hoped, it soon seemed like his efforts to befriend Jack were working, 
as the family would wake up to find piles of rabbits stacked up on the wall in the yard outside the farm, apparently left by Jack in return for the food. Then, in early January 1932, Jack decided to begin opening up to James. First and foremost, Jack set the Irving straight on his name. He didn't like Jack, he said. Instead, he asked to be called Jeff, though he seemed to struggle somewhat with the spelling, as he explained that it was spelt G-E-F. By now, Jeff's story had been circulating pretty freely around the western coast of the Isle of Man. James had not been particularly shy about talking to people about the mystery animal visiting his farmhouse, and as such, it gained both a reputation and a new nickname. Known by those outside of Dawlish Cashin as the Dalby Spook, the various goings-on up at the farm had spread first to the nearby villages of Dalby and Glen May, and then on to the town of Peel, before somehow managing to find its way across the water, all the way to a journalist in England who heard the rumours and thought that they would surely be worth checking out. Before long, the reporter was making his way up to Dawlish Cashin in order to research his piece on the mystery that he would publish in the Daily Dispatch. The mysterious man-weasel of Dawlish Cashin has spoken to me today. Investigation of the most remarkable animal story that has ever been given publicity, a story which is finding credence all over the island, leaves me in an incredible state of perplexity. Had I heard a weasel speak? I do not know, but I do know that I had heard today a voice which I should never have imagined could have issued from a human throat. That the people who claim it was the voice of a strange weasel seem sane, honest and responsible folk and not likely to indulge in a difficult, long, drawn-out and unprofitable practical joke to make themselves the talk of the world, and that others have had the same experience as myself. During his stay, James went on to tell the reporter that he had managed to teach Jack how to talk, even including a few words in French, German, Spanish, Yiddish, Flemish and Hebrew, as he said to himself he had a smattering of languages that he'd picked up from his business. It speaks quite intelligently and holds conversations with us about happenings in the district. The other day, I asked it, who taught you to speak? It said, you taught me. It never uses a word which it could not have picked up, either from us or from people around the district. It told me that there was a new postman in the postman's hut a mile and a half away, and I discovered that this was correct. Unfortunately, Jeff had kept quiet the entire time that the reporter had been in the farmhouse questioning the Irvings. But as he had made to leave... James called him back, telling him that Jeff had just started up, making weird noises, which James said was the animal imitating a threshing mill. The reporter gave his full witness account as part of the article. At first, I could not make out individual words, and I edged my way slightly into the porch. In a mirror on the other side of the sitting room, I could see the reflection of the little girl sitting motionless at the table. Mrs Irving, in another room, was unseen to me. Mrs Irving said, The gentleman has gone now. A voice replied in an eerie shriek, He has not. Mrs Irving said, He has. The voice replied, I can hear him whispering. I was actually whispering to Mr Irving when the voice went on, I do not talk for these people, they are all liars. Then, silence. Then it said, I can see the shadow. The sun was overcast at the time and I was throwing no shadow. I came into the room and there was silence. This report also gave several names of locals who had all witnessed Jeff speaking and singing, though none had actually seen the creature themselves. Amazingly, whether he was telling the truth or simply trying to maintain an air of credibility, or, or maybe he was simply trying to rescue his reputation from the grips of the sections of the local community that believed the family to be a gang of witches, James insisted to the unnamed dispatch reporter that he was quite sure that there was nothing supernatural going on in the farmhouse. Jeff was simply a flesh and blood talking animal, apparently. <laughs> Given his own theory as to what was going on, James continued that he believed Jeff was a cross between either a weasel or a stoat and a ferret, and that it had an unusual throat formation and the heightened intelligence due to the crossing of the strains. Though how he thought this sounded any less insane than simply calling it the Dolby Spook is really beyond comprehension. Addressing some of the criticism and theories that Voy Ray had been a talented ventriloquist that had been bandied around by some of the locals and that had recently been published in another paper, James simply stated, If she can do it so well, we could make our fortunes on the stage. It is ridiculous. <laughs> 
With the publication of the report, the cat, or man weasel, was truly out of the bag and before long, Jeff's story was being printed around the world as newspapers as far away as Australia picked up the story and reprinted it in all its bizarre glory. The local Isle of Man papers also published a handful of articles throughout February on the Dolby Spook, which was quickly working its way into Manx occult legend, and the farmhouse, usually so serene in its isolation, was becoming the place to be for many Manx sightseers, hoping to catch a glimpse or hear a few words from the infamous spook. The Irvings were receiving so many daily visitors that James was eventually forced to publish a small personal advert in the local paper, requesting that visitors were by invite only. The situation was not at all helped by papers like the Peel City Guardian and Chronicle, who published stunningly sensational articles describing the farmhouse as a lair and the spook as having the body of a weasel or a cat and a pig's head with great glowing eyes, hissing breath and a high-pitched voice. Amongst all this rumour-mongering and sensation that filled the press throughout the month of February, it was a local man named W.A. Tear that wrote a letter published in the Isle of Man Weekly Times that would make the first breakthrough into discovering exactly what the spook might actually have been, when he wrote a letter in suggesting that Jeff may have been the descendant of a flock of mongooses that had been brought to the island 20 years previous, imported by a farmer hoping to use them to control the rat and rabbit populations a few miles south of Dawlish Cashin. Jeff seemed to take to this idea, and soon after he told James that he was indeed a marsh mongoose, immortalising himself in folklore as Jeff the Talking Mongoose. With the story of Jeff making its way across the world, it wasn't too long before those with such interests became aware of such an unusual story. On the 12th of February, Miss Florence Milburn, a resident of Peel, sent a letter to Harry Price, by now a well-known psychical researcher with a long history of work within the Society for Psychical Research, especially in the area of spiritual mediumship, where he debunked several professional mediums. After plenty of disputes over his practice of paying mediums in order to test them, Price had founded his own rival research laboratory in Kensington, London, in order to continue his work without the conflict. By 1931, however, Price was at something of a low ebb in his research career and had been considering leaving psychical research altogether. When Price received Miss Milburn's letter concerning a local talking mongoose, he wrote to James Irving with some trepidation. However, after he received a reply a few weeks later, filling out more details, including the fact that he and his family had not profited from the situation, he decided that the story was worth looking into, and so he sent a member of his laboratory, Harold Dennis, to go and scout out the farm. Living nearby to Price in rural Sussex, Harold Egerton Dennis and Price were keen friends. Dennis had been born in Lancashire in 1879 into a wealthy family with businesses linked to copper smelting and railway engineering, and he had spent his entire life spending his father's money in order to pioneer within the motor racing space. During the First World War, he had volunteered as an ambulance driver for the Red Cross, before, like so many others, he became interested in spiritualism and psychical research between the wars. Price turned to Dennis for the Jeff case, more so due to his interest in the zoological, however, as Dennis was an avid collector of exotic animals and a long-time member of the Royal Zoological Society. If anyone was best positioned to check out a new species of talking animal, it would be Dennis, figured Price. And so it was that on the evening of Friday the 26th of February, Dennis found himself trudging up a slippery, rocky path in near darkness, heading up to the hillside to Dawlish Cashin. He had already checked into the Waterfall Inn in the nearby village of Glen May, but keen to experience the company of Jeff, he set off to meet the Irvings, arriving at the farmhouse at around 7.30pm. Inside, he found a well-decorated, dimly lit room, complete with all three of the Irvings, who were seemingly happy to welcome the researcher to the farm. After giving Dennis a tour of the farmhouse, where they pointed out all the cracks and holes in the walls that Jeff supposedly used to sneak around, the four sat up until nearly midnight, asking and answering questions about Jeff, with Dennis learning the complete backstory to the strange events. At the end of the night, with no showing from the talkative mongoose himself, Dennis made to leave, and James grabbed their coats and insisted on helping him back down to Glen May, given the darkness and the difficulty of the path down the hill. 
just as they stepped outside into the cool night, slamming the door behind them. A shrill voice pierced the air, screaming over the top of the disturbed geese in the farmyard. Go away! Who is that man? Excited, James turned to Dennis, whispering to him that Jeff must have finally arrived. Creeping up to the door to listen, the two men stood in silence for another five minutes before Dennis insisted that the cold weather really dictated that he should get going. James, however, had other ideas and invited him back into the farmhouse in order to see if Jeff was still around. The two men stepped carefully back into the house, trying to make as little disturbance as possible. But Jeff had apparently had enough for the night, and after 15 minutes of waiting and hearing no more unexplained sounds, Dennis called an end to the evening and tramped his way down to his hotel to get some rest after a long day. The next morning, Dennis made his way back to the farmhouse bright and early. Jeff was known to be active around the farm at any time of day, so the bright morning did nothing to deter any excitement that today would be the day that he might hear Jeff in his famous conversation. It was an enthusiasm that was stoked upon his arrival when he learnt from James that Jeff had been talking all morning. James promised that he would have a strong word with the mongoose and convince him to talk with Dennis that evening, if only he would secure the gift of either a camera or a gramophone for Voiray. He would also have to shout out to Jeff, explaining that he believed in the mongoose's presence, since Jeff had apparently told James that he did not like Dennis at all due to his sceptical beliefs. Dennis agreed to both concessions and sat down to chat with James and Voiray and learn more about Jeff. Margaret had gone out to visit her family that day in Peel, but between the two of them, Dennis managed to learn more about Jeff whilst he sat at the kitchen table, drinking tea and observing the Irvings whilst they waited for Jeff's arrival. It wasn't until 5.30pm that anything notable happened, and then it wasn't any phantom voice that broke the steel farmhouse. Instead, Dennis witnessed one of Jeff's other little tricks when he started tossing small items about the room. While we were talking, something was thrown from the panel behind Mr Irving. It struck the teapot, or possibly a cup, and Mr Irving said, That's the animal. We examined the cloth and found a large packing case needle, which I picked up and gently threw at the teapot, when exactly the same noise was again made, Mr Irving saying that it constantly threw things at the family. At 6.15pm, we heard plates and similar things being moved in the small scullery. No one was there. A little later, again the same noise, and again no one there, but we found a little stream of water running from a small hole in the wall, which Mr Irving said was the animal performing its natural functions. I saw no signs of rats or mice, but Mr Irving said that there were plenty of weasels about. Margaret returned from Pill shortly after, and feeling frustrated that Jeff had not yet opened his mouth to chat to their visitor, James asked his wife to go upstairs and try and stir Jeff into talking, hoping that they could maybe kickstart him by giving him the security of a quiet room with only members of the family present, and then coax him down shortly after. Taking Voiray with her, the two women made their way up to the bedroom directly above the kitchen, and within minutes a shrill scream rang out through the small house, followed by Mrs Irving's voice calling out to Jeff, No, come on and talk. Mrs Irving's words seemed to have the desired effect as Jeff launched into a long period of quiet chatter which lasted almost 15 minutes before Dennis decided to take matters into his own hands, shouting out into the room that he believed in the mongoose and asked him to come down and talk to him. Jeff immediately let his thoughts be known to the researcher, replying in a clear, high-pitched voice, No, I don't mean to stay long as I don't like you. (laughs) Not willing to just accept no for an answer, Dennis decided to have a go at creeping up the staircase in order to see into the bedroom above, hoping to catch a glimpse of Jeff. Unfortunately, the staircase in the farmhouse was anything but even, and consequently, Dennis ended up tripping up on one of the irregular steps, crashing onto the carpeted wood and alerting Jeff to his presence, scuppering any chance of Jeff talking to him that evening. Dennis stayed until midnight once again, but the voice never returned, and so he made a rather disappointed journey back down to the waterfall inn. The second visit was also the end of Dennis's short trip to the farm, and the next day he made his way back to London with a full report for Price. Foy Ray had been an interesting young girl, he thought, tomboyish in her interests in hunting and engineering, but tall and dressed prettily, and even wore perfume while she tended to the livestock. James, he thought, had been domineering when the family had talked together about Jeff, frequently taking charge and direction of the conversation, 
But it was Margaret, who Dennis thought was the strongest character in the household, charismatic and charming, but with piercing eyes. Despite his disappointments and inconclusive time spent at the farm, Dennis found the family to be trustworthy and genuine, though he admitted to Price that he wasn't quite sure what to think of the whole affair. It was around a month after Dennis's visit to the farm that Jeff, becoming more and more friendly with the Irvings, decided to open up a little bit more about himself. One evening, he filled James in on his history, where he explained that he had been born in India on the 7th of June in 1852 in Delhi and had belonged to two men, one who had been disfigured and walked with a hunchback. He told James that he had been shot and killed in India before he made his way across land and sea to wind up on Dawlish Cashin around 20 years prior, though details of exact journey were kept to himself, aside from saying that a man named Holland had brought him through Egypt, where he had seen the Sphinx rising out of the sand. It was about this time that Jeff also took up residence in a small sanctuary in an alcove at the top of the stairs, where the Irvings would place food like bacon, butter, sausages and kippers for him to eat, as well as his favourite ball that he apparently enjoyed to bounce around. By mid-1932, Jeff had more or less attached himself to Voy Ray almost exclusively, following her around the farm and even to school, commuting on the bus with her every day. When he wasn't with Voy Ray, Jeff was usually out and about on the island somewhere and he would frequently return to the farm and let the Irvings know all the local gossip that he had been picking up on his adventures. Jeff was, by now, a fairly friendly presence around the farm and he had long since dropped the threats that he had introduced himself to the family with. However, one event did show that Jeff could turn nasty if he was so inclined. One of the neighbouring farmers had been talking about Jeff in the nearby village, insinuating fairly heavily that Voy Ray had been helping the Dolby Spook rumours. When Jeff heard of this, he left the farm and headed out towards the neighbours, who woke the next morning to find all of their poultry had been killed overnight. Generally speaking though, Jeff's trips around the island were peaceful enough, and his time on the farm was mostly spent hunting rabbits, killing rats in the outbuildings, and playing hide-and-seek with Boy Ray, which, given his propensity to remain unseen, one can only imagine that this was a game that he was unnaturally skilled at. On several occasions, Margaret grew tired of Jeff's commotion, or, more honestly, the commotion caused by the many spiritualists that visited the farm throughout 1932, and she would curse the mongoose, wishing that he would disappear for good. Jeff didn't think much of this attitude, and he would reply, nuts on you, a term that was beginning to be used more frequently towards anyone that he didn't like. By now, James was slowly beginning to soften on his opinion of Jeff too. Perhaps it was the constant conversations back and forth with an invisible entity, but finally he was beginning to believe that Jeff might just be something a little supernatural. Since the spring of 1932, he'd been keeping a meticulous diary of Jeff's doings around the house, frequently sending snippets in his communications with Harry Price, and though he still believed Jeff to have the flesh and blood body of an animal, he was now considering him to have the mind of something far more human. Margaret considered him to be something of a shapeshifter, and both were now fairly certain that at some point in time, Jeff had been human, finding that his breadth and body of knowledge along with his mannerisms, to just be a little too uncanny. James had been a little more willing to believe that Jeff was not a natural being after he had told him that he could do magic himself. Furthermore, it was becoming more and more apparent that Jeff had some kind of telepathic abilities as he seemed to be able to know what had been going on around the farm even when he was not present. Or conversely, he could tell the Irvings about goings-on in the villages and towns despite clearly being at home on the farm. One big problem with James's understanding of Jeff was that Jeff himself seemed to be keen to obfuscate his exact existence. At times, he would assure James that he was not a spirit, whilst at other times he would explain that he was a ghost in an animal form. Jeff, it turned out, was more than a little bit of a trickster. James was fairly sure that his claims of being a ghost were not entirely true, especially as he seemed to be scared of the ghost stories that Jeff would ask James to tell him at night before bedtime. If Jeff was a ghost then how was he able to consume so much food? Furthermore, in April, Jeff seemed to fall ill, shouting to James one night that he had fallen sick. He then proceeded to spend the night making vomiting noises from behind the wood panelling throughout the house. Apparently, he had stolen some food from one of the neighbouring farmhouses, and whatever it had been, 
hadn't settled with him too well. On another occasion, Jeff developed a cough one night and he asked James to toss him a few peppermints from his bed, which James did, prompting Jeff to grope around in the dark until he called out to James, letting him know that he had found the peppermints. This stealing of the food from a neighbouring farmhouse was another feature of Jeff's that had developed that year. When he was out and about on his little excursions, he would sometimes return with small trinkets in his possession that he claimed he had found, a paintbrush here, a pair of pliers there. Jeff had slowly become something of a hoarder, and he would collect all these small items in a little pile in his sanctuary. By 1933, Jeff was practically tame, more or less becoming something of a pet to the Irvings, and on several occasions, he allowed them to pet his fur. He gripped their fingers in order to show him his peculiar human-like hands, and he even allowed Margaret to place her finger inside his mouth in order to feel his teeth. All of this was achieved, somehow, without ever really being seen. If Jeff hated anything, it was anyone trying to catch a glimpse of him. And though the Irvings thought they spotted him perched on the beams in the ceilings of the farmhouse, Jeff was never particularly happy about the fact. Once or twice, James thought he spotted him outside of the farmhouse, and Margaret too thought that she spotted him darting across the hedges outside. When Jeff spotted Margaret trying to spy him through one of the cracks in the panelling inside the farmhouse one day, he shouted out to her, You're looking! Stop looking! Turn your head, you bitch! As the year continued on, Jeff also began developing the ability to sing happy tunes, entertaining the Irvings, and, without much of an explanation, he also began speaking in several different languages, including Hindustani, which he explained by his presence in India in the 19th century. In fact, Jeff became quite the entertainer all round, and he would frequently demonstrate one of his new tricks to visitors of guessing whether or not a coin placed in one of the small holes in the wall near his sanctum was showing heads or tails. Though this answers were not always 100% accurate. By 1935, Dennis and Price had begun talking about Dennis paying a second visit to Dawlish Cashin to see if he might have more success at hearing Jeff now that he had seemingly become fairly well domesticated. James called out to Jeff and explained that he had been speaking with the researcher once again and they would implore him to show himself if Dennis was to make his way out to the farm in order to pay Jeff a visit. As expected, Jeff was none too keen on this idea and burst out, I'll go to his house and smash the windows with my fist, and those I cannot reach with my hands, I'll break with a pitcher pole. This outburst of Jeff, telling James that he should instead go and write to Dennis and tell him that, that Jeff would go and haunt him, had James reply to the mongoose that he should go and clear out from the farm. Jeff replied that he was not friends with him anymore, though his threats were seemingly empty, as he not only remained at the farmhouse, but even supplied the Irvings with a small tuft of his hair, which he placed in a bowl in the living room. James promptly had this sent to Dennis for testing, and Dennis promptly forwarded it on to Harry Price, who himself sent it on to Professor Julian Huxley at his research lab, and to Mr Martin Duncan of London Zoo, who wrote to Price shortly after with his analysis of the sample. I have carefully examined them microscopically and compared them with hairs of known origin in my collection. As a result, I can very definitely state that the specimen hairs never grew upon a mongoose, nor are they those of a rat, rabbit, hare, squirrel or other rodent, or from a sheep, goat or cow. I am inclined to think that these hairs have probably been taken from a longish-haired dog or dogs. The sample contains hairs of two different thicknesses, though this may only represent upper and undercoat. Domestic dogs are not well represented in my collection of furs, which is composed chiefly from material we have in the Zoological Society's gardens. Therefore, I feel only disposed to suggest, rather than make a definite decision, as I have had to base my opinion upon a comparison of the hairs of the wolf and of a collie dog. I did find, however, that both of these, in the shape and pattern of the cuticular scales and the medulla of your specimens, sufficiently close to make me think that very probably yours are of canine origin. One point that might be of interest, though trivial at first sight, I could not detect in the hand a single hair showing the root bulb, which rather points to their hair having been cut off their animal owner. When you visit the farm, keep a lookout for any dog or other domestic animal about the place with slightly curly hair and of the fawn and dark colour of your sample, and if opportunity occurs that you can gather a few hairs, it might be worth doing. Duncan wrote a second time a few days later, this time including a series of photo micrographs of both Jeff's fur and those of a dog, which he felt 
pretty conclusively showed an almost exact match. Whilst all of this was happening, Price was busy trying to secure a second form of proof of Jeff by asking James to try and photograph the animal for him. Foyray took the duties, close as she was with Jeff, and also the most technologically minded of the family. Several times, James made a deal with Jeff to show up and pose for a picture, but on all occasions, Jeff stood them up, only returning later that day when he was hungry, asking for biscuits. Eventually, James and Jeff struck up a deal that he would sit for a portrait on the coming Sunday. However, rather than sitting still, Jeff instead chose to bolt across the frame of the camera, and though Voyre pressed the shutter, the speed of Jeff was too quick, and he failed to appear in the photo when it was developed. Dennis finally made his second visit up to the farm on the 20th of May 1935, over three years after his first. Once again, he chose to stay at the Waterfall Inn in Glen May, where he checked in before making his way up to Dawlish Cashin, arriving around 7pm, where Margaret greeted him with their typical hospitality, inviting him in and making him welcome by serving tea. Quickly, the conversation turned to Jeff, and soon after, Foyray left the house in order to tend some poultry in one of the outhouses. While she was in the yard, around a hundred yards from the farmhouse, Jeff let out an incoherent scream of noise. Shortly after, Foyray returned and told Dennis that Jeff was prepared to exhibit his notorious coin trick for the researcher, and so James took him out to the porch, where he explained the trick to Dennis and had him place a penny on one of the ledges by the window. Whilst he did so, all three of the Irvings returned to the living room before. Satisfied that the coin had been placed in complete secrecy, Dennis returned there himself in order to await Jeff's arrival. The details are not clear on how or when Jeff did finally arrive on the scene, but the result was simply that Jeff called the coin incorrectly. Dennis flipped the coin once more, and this time Jeff called the coin correctly. It was a fairly lacklustre performance, all told, but for the first time, all three of the Irvings had been in the room with Dennis whilst the mongoose had been talking out loud, so that had given the researcher at least something to think about on his way back down to the village late that evening. The next day, Dennis and James had planned to spend much more time up at the farmhouse, and so, after sharing a drink over lunch at the Waterfall Inn, they took a walk along the beach before making their way up to the farm. Curiously, upon their arrival, Margaret told Dennis that Jeff had already been with them that day and had watched the two men walk along the beach. She even managed to repeat some of their conversation that had passed between the two, as well as telling Dennis of how Jeff had seen him pick a flower from the side of the path that he adorned in his buttonhole. It was a promising start to the day for Dennis, who already felt more impressed than he had ever been on his first trip, and so the group settled down to await Jeff's appearance with some enthusiasm. But it wasn't until Voyre had left to go out into the yard and feed the chickens that any voice came. This time, as a shout from behind the wood panelling at the back of the living room that sounded out, Plus fours, Oxford bags! Apparently, this was in reference to Dennis's dress sense. It had been a strange outburst, but another fairly curious one, especially as Dennis could see Voyre out in the yard about a hundred yards from the house as the voice had been calling out. The rest of the evening passed peacefully until James and Dennis got ready to leave the house and head back down to the village around midnight. Whilst they were out in the yard, Dennis heard the by now familiar high-pitched voice of Jeff cry out behind them, cooey, as they made their way down the path. Dennis made one final visit to the farm, five months later, arriving on the evening of the 2nd of October. This time, he stayed with the Irvings at Dawlish Cashin itself. When he arrived at the farmhouse, Margaret informed him that he had just crossed paths with Jeff, who had made his way down into Glen May in order to see if Dennis had arrived yet, though she assured him that he would be back in due time. Dennis sat together with James, Margaret and Voyre until about 9pm, before any sign of Jeff's return became apparent, when the geese, who had always acted like guard dogs for the farm, started going mad in the yard outside. Sure that this was signalling Jeff's return, the group sat expectantly. But by 11.30, and still with no sign of the chatty little mongoose, Dennis's hopes began to fade. Voyre had already retired to bed half an hour earlier, when finally a series of raps began sounding their way across the house. James called out, Is that you, Jeff? But no reply came, prompting Dennis to shout out too. Come on, Jeff, if you won't talk, make a noise. Dennis's report details Jeff's response. 
Raps of various qualities of sound started from different points of the house with great rapidity. I then heard a bedroom door bang with extraordinary violence, so suggested we might go upstairs to see what happened. At that minute, a shrill, very excited and highly pitched voice screamed out, Go and look! So up we went, and found the fastener on the outside of Voiray's door was turned down, so she could not get out of the room. Opening the lock, Dennis stepped into Voiray's room and spoke to her, asking her what had happened, where she explained that Jeff was seemingly in the attic, running around above their heads. Stepping back out into the landing and re-locking the door behind him, Dennis made his way back downstairs, when suddenly Jeff kicked off, as loud screams tore through the house and a rapid series of knocking and thudding bounced throughout the house, one moment on a ceiling, the next in a wall on the other side of the room. The commotion continued for almost 15 minutes straight, before concluding with a huge crash that sounded very much like something heavy had been tossed around upstairs. Rushing back up, Dennis found Voire still in her room, though a large chair weighing around 12 pounds had been pulled over onto its side. Voire calmly explained that this was just one of Jeff's tricks, keen as he was on the chair, often bouncing his ball or dancing on it and taking some of his meals there. Dennis composed himself and made his way back down to the kitchen, and no sooner had he sat down, the voice kicked off again, this time louder than before. At one point, Jeff called out that he would imitate a steam whistle before screaming out loud for a consistent 22 seconds, which Dennis described as having a very clear and natural timbre. Calling out again, Dennis asked Jeff to come nearer so that he could hear his voice properly. In reply, another loud crash came from the bottom of the stairs. I shouted, That's splendid, Jeff. Knock the blinking house down. To this, he laughed loudly. So I said, Jeff, let's have one of your demoniacal laughs. But although we had it, my blood did not freeze in my veins. I then said, Do come much nearer to us. And hardly had I finished speaking when the voice came practically to the kitchen entrance and shouted, Hello, everybody. This occurred two or three times. And on the two latter occasions, I rushed out with my flash lamp threw a beam of light up the staircase, only to find no one there, but to be greeted with a shout away in the distance, You damn sleech! As I was returning down the staircase and just entering the kitchen, a bottle and a china tray were flung from the top of the staircase, the latter being smashed in the fall. This was accompanied by a derisive laugh. I again examined Voiray's door. It was still fastened. The voice then said, Spies! We asked what that meant, and it replied, Someone outside the house poaching your rabbits. Mr Irving and myself went out and thought we heard someone, but could not be sure. On returning, the voice said, I am going, vanished. But I asked for more noises, and to finish with that, the voice might come behind the kitchen panelling. After many arguments, such as, You are moving again from your seat, etc, etc, we had a terrific repetition of knocks and bangs all over the house, up and down the stairs, and close to us in the panelling, finishing with a shout, just behind Mrs Irving, who was sitting close to the back panelling of the kitchen. It had been an evening of quite a bit of chaos, and Jeff was not finished. Aware that Dennis was staying in the farmhouse, he threatened the researcher, saying, I mean to throw a brick at you tonight when you are asleep. With this unnerving outburst, Jeff then said that he would throw pebbles right now, and as he finished talking, small cracks were heard on the pane of the glass, as small stones flicked up against it. By now it was 3am and both James and Margaret were beginning to look and feel quite at the end of their tether with everything that had gone on that evening. Margaret yelled at Jeff to stop, saying that she was concerned for the windows. And for once, Jeff proved obedient and the house fell into silence. Dennis managed three hours sleep that night before he was woken at 7am by a shrill voice screaming out to him, Get up, Dennis! It had been a long and eventful night at Dawlish Cashin and before Dennis left later that day, he handed over a gift of a selection of cream cakes for Jeff and thanked the family for their hospitality. Upon his return to London, he forwarded Harry Price's report. Still unsure of what to make of everything, Price, who had finally decided the time was ripe to visit the farm for himself just a month prior to Dennis's third visit, was quite surprised at reading of all the activity that Dennis had witnessed. His own trip had been quite different, and his visit along with the reports from Dennis, had not done much to help either man in getting to the bottom of the case of the other mysterious talking mongoose. 
So that was part one to the story of Jeff, the talking mongoose. And we'll talk a little about that after these short advert breaks. Welcome back. So I will keep this brief because I want to keep, sort of save my main thoughts on this whole affair uh, for the end of next next week's episode. But um, for now, I'll say that, yeah, I, I this was a, such a long time coming, this episode. You know, Jeff is such a staple in, in sort of fringe history and Fortiana that, I, you know, it's a story that I love. It, 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 it sums up everything that I love about this kind of thing, that, that the whole idea, that, you know, is it a talking mongoose or just a, or, or a ghost or a spirit and all these kind of possibilities and the fact that it's all so absolutely ridiculous, really, and yet you just want it to be real and it's, it's just fun to read and, and it's just, there's so much to love about this. Partly that's also the reason I, I've just never done the episode because, of course, like it's been done before. I felt like, do I really need to just keep adding more and more noise to to the pile, you know, of stuff on the internet about Jeff? Probably not. So, so I, I just didn't really feel like doing it. But then I saw that a new film had been released all about Jeff, and I saw it had Simon Pegg in it, and I was like, well, you know what? If if this is good enough for Simon Pegg, it's definitely good enough for Dark History. So let's get into it. So anyway, I watched that film as part of the research for this. I mean, not serious research, but I, I wanted to watch the film really just to see how they approach the story. And, and because it was Simon Pegg and a film about the talking mongoose, which I would have watched regardless. Well, and this isn't a film review podcast, but it's really bad. It's really, really bad. Somehow, unbelievably, they've managed to make the tale of Jeff utterly boring and it, to make matters worse, it's filmed in this really like quirky, almost Wes Anderson with sort of like uh, sort of oversaturated and quite carefully chosen colour palettes. It's not quite Wes Anderson, but it's, it's along those sort of lines, you know, that, those quirky indie films. And that sort of generally lends to lead itself to that air of like fairy tale and whimsy and, and usually humour as well. And then you've got Simon Peck, who's very funny himself. But the film isn't actually funny. There isn't a single funny line in it. it. It's it's completely played completely straight. At times, it's factually so accurate that it's almost a documentary and it's almost quoting like word for word from sort of uh, certain sources that, that I read um, whilst obviously doing the research. But at other times, it completely plays fast and loose with the story and just makes up like piles of nonsense. So I... I guess what I'm trying to say is don't waste your time. <laughs> Watch it if you really love Jeff. Watch it if you really love Simon Pegg. Watch it if you really love Mini Driver because, you know, Mini Driver, Simon Pegg, they're both brilliant actors. I love them both. Watch it if you're kind of like me and you think, how are, that's two hours, that surely can't be bad. But don't expect too much. Anyway, so this isn't really a film podcast. Um, so anyway, if you would like to contact me, you can do so. Contact at darkhistory.com is the email address. And then uh, any social media that I'm on, which is pretty much all of them, search Dark Histories, you'll find it. Um, yeah, otherwise, uh, you can go on the website, darkhistories.com, and you can find all the ways that you can uh, get in touch with me, including uh, like Discord, um, all the social media, and of course, all the ways you can support. Um, and if you would like to do that, would be, you know, greatly received because, um, you know, I do actually, like, like, like this is a good example of this episode, I do actually do like, pay for sources and things like that um uh, like this i i bought several old um newspapers and magazines as well as um i i, I paid for a couple of um dig- digitization of, of records and stuff um so you know your support is always uh you know, greatly received anyway enough about that thank you very much for listening yeah as i said uh next week uh will only be one week between this and part two um, we're going to be dealing with Price's own visit to the farm, Nando Fodor's visit to the farm, crazy court cases that have judges considering whether it's mongai, mongooses or mongeese, uh, which turns out it's mongooses, by the way. So, yeah, um, that's all coming up next week. So until then, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this first part. Like I said, I don't really like doing two-part episodes because I don't like leaving people hanging. But... This is the way this has sort of worked out with at least it's only one week between this part and part two. Hopefully you don't have to wait too long for the next part. Say, so, anyway, thank you very much for listening. 
I love this story. So I'm having such a you know great time sharing it with you. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for listening. Um, until next week, when we conclude Jeff, take care, sleep tight.